Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Legacy comes from the Latin word legatia, which refers to people who are sent out on a mission, and ostensibly a mission into the future. Today, we're going to talk about the idea of legacy, how that influenced Jung's decisions, how it influences our decisions, as we choose between serving the pains and pleasures of a given moment versus casting our imagination forward intergenerationally and being moved by the kinds of influences that we may or may abdicate from as we imagine the repercussions of our actions. So today we're going to talk about legacy. You know, I don't think most of us project ourselves forward into the future in an intergenerational way very frequently as we go about our days. It isn't very common that we we wonder about what impact our life will have on those who follow us, whether it's our children or just the culture at large. But it's a real perspective shifting thought to find ourselves wondering, what will my legacy be? It is something that rumbles through the collective every New Year's. If we even look at some of the traditional cartoons around New Year's, you see Father Time as a kind of skeletal or exhausted figure, and the New Year is this kind of new generation of of baby, that there's something about the end of the year and the solstice, by the way, which brings up this idea of death and a new life. And part of legacy is inexorably woven into concerns about death. Well, and I think it it brings up this issue of time. I mean, one of the things that happens at the end of the year is we have this sense that another year has passed that may put us in touch with our own mortality. But it does remind us of the inexorable passage of time. And uh, again, I think most of us deal with time on fairly short frameworks. I mean, we think about how long until we have our lunch break, or Mm -hmm. we think about something that we need to buy before the weekend gets here. I mean, Perhaps we engage in retirement planning and we're thinking about a time horizon of a few decades away. But to think on longer term horizons, especially those that extend beyond our own lifespan, there's a nonprofit called the Long Now Foundation. 
And their whole focus is to encourage imagination at the time scale of civilization. So that would be about 10,000 years. And one of their projects is they have the clock of the long now, which is a mechanical monument designed to keep accurate time for the next 10,000 years. They're trying to encourage this kind of time scale thinking. And uh, by the way, their website is longnow.org. And thinking on these time scales, when we insert ourselves into that kind of time scale, we can feel immensely small. But we might also concern ourselves with uh, what will my impact be on my descendants, on the culture at large, and a hundred years, or a thousand years, or perhaps even 10,000 years? What is my legacy going to be? And around that question is, what motivates me to care about that? It's one thing to have an imagination for a moment about future, to think about foresight in general, but there is a there's a real war going on in the culture of the United States, at least, between immediacy and futurity. And it comes down to even micro decisions. For instance, and I don't say this to be overly political, but it's in our discourse, whether or not to get vaccinated. You know, there's a kind of immediacy argument that's made. I'm healthy. Everyone else is healthy. I've never had a vaccine or vaccines have never helped me. You know, everything's going to be fine. I'm not in suffering right now. Or that there's an immediate sense that I don't want the economy to be negatively reacted right now. And so we need to kind of come forward. Some people hold a greater sense of futurity and foresight. So for them, getting the vaccine is protecting in their minds, protecting their grandparents that they're going to visit in six months from getting ill, perhaps protecting their children as they move forward. The idea of a vaccine is inherently aligned with futurity. Is it something we do now that we imagine in the future will provide us with some kind of a benefit. In the short term, we may have to suffer some anxiety and unsurety about having this strange thing injected into our bodies. But without the sense of futurity, it's hard to even have a motivation for some people. Well, I'm thinking of another example, too. I mean, I, I came home last night from my trip, and there was this uh, incredible box of chocolate waiting for me. And I, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that looks really delicious. And I couldn't help having some. But of course, that was a trade-off between my desire to have something delicious in the immediate term and then the future benefit of me knowing that I'd feel better and be healthier if I ate less chocolate. So the future benefit of being healthy is really discounted against the immediate return of eating something delicious. And this idea of delaying gratification, even in the short term, is positively correlated with success in your jobs, financial successes, and any number of other important developmental processes or developing processes in one life, in one's life. The ability to say, wait a minute, think and think forward. Now, when we're talking about legacy, we're taking that same kind of energy and we're extending it a generation. Or for some people, if their imagination is willing to take hold of it, to extend multi-generations forward. And in that multi-generational way, we're talking about things like the economic health of a nation, as well as, in much broader terms, the health of the ecosystem and the health of the planet. And it's quite an extraordinary war of values that's happening internationally. Do we project our imagination forward and feel a kind of stewardship of the planetary health even, 
Or do we have just a sense of immediacy and what some psychologists call tribalism, that what's happening in my house, in my neighborhood, with my offspring, that's the only thing that matters. And within the next 20 years, for instance, I have a sense that everything is going to be copacetic. And so these ideas of what's going to happen you know, in an ocean on the other side of the planet really doesn't affect my imagination and therefore it does not affect my choices. And, and it's an interesting reality that people's imaginations work differently. Yeah, Joseph, I mean, I think you're, you're pointing out something really important there that it's one thing for me to say, well, gee, if I don't have this chocolate now, then maybe I'll feel better and be healthier, you know, in the coming months. But to think about legacy really puts it into a very different frame, because we're talking about doing something that won't have any impact for us. You know, I can make a decision now to defer gratification or to uh, suffer through some inconvenience for a future benefit. At the level of legacy, there is no benefit to me personally. I won't be here anymore. So we're really talking about something quite different. And I, I think that it is a remarkable human ability to project our imagination forward and to feel a kinship or empathy with people who aren't even alive yet. They're not even on the planet, but that we might want to do something that would have a benefit for them. There's a story that is probably at least partly just fiction, but it's a really wonderful story. Maybe many of you have heard it, but it has to do with the oak beams, I believe in the, the big refectory at the New College in Oxford. So at Oxford University, New College was founded in 1379, and there's a, a dining hall that has these huge oak beams across the ceiling. And the story goes that about 100 years ago, it was discovered that the beams were infested with beetles and would need to be replaced. And that the college agonized over this because they didn't know where they would find oak trees large enough to be, uh, you know, suitable for these beams. And uh, so one of the junior fellows contacted the college forester. And the college forester says, well, well of course, when the college was founded, we knew that those beams would need to be replaced. So we planted a grove of oaks, and that grove is now 500 years old and just right to be harvested to use to replace these beams. So, so again, there's, there's probably some fact and some fiction in this story, but if you can just imagine it as a fable that at the time that the college was founded, someone had the foresight to think, 500 years from now, those beams are going to need to be replaced. Let's plant the trees. So to feel oneself enough a member of a human community that you could do the right thing for that community, even when you know that your personal existence will be separated from the eventual outcome by centuries. That's a pretty awe-inspiring perspective. It is. And I think stories like that are important because we need to remember that previous generations have held that kind of attitude and we are the beneficiaries of that vision. In some of the bits of clinical research that's been done around the idea of legacy, if we feel and believe that previous generations have not cared about us, it's much less likely that we will pass anything forward in terms of concerns and decisions. If we can find evidence that our ancestors or previous generations have suffered and made very specific decisions that we are benefiting from now, we are much more likely 
to feel that same kind of generosity towards the future. So I think stories like that, which might be part myth, but are probably part true, are essential to keep alive in the culture. You you know, I think it goes to the very important idea of meaning. And uh, if we believe that, you know, our life is sort of a, an accident of chemistry, that we're here, we get to indulge ourselves and enjoy ourselves to the maximum degree that we're able to, and then we're going to die, and that there will be nothing left after us. We There's, you know, no kind of continuation of existence in any way then that really invites us to take full advantage of being here in a way that doesn't look out for future generations. And it also leaves us as uh, having no sense of meaning. And Jung, of course, and we've referenced this several times on the podcast, noted that most of the people that came to him were really suffering from an absence of meaning in their lives. He felt that this was one of the great issues for modern people, that we, we don't always feel connected with a sense of meaning. And there are, of course, many ways to experience meaning. One, one tends to have to find that for oneself these days. We don't tend to have it prescribed for us by conventional religions, and unless we, we do in fact find a conventional religion that is kind of meaningful to us and can hold that kind of meaning. But for the rest of us, we have to sort it out for ourselves. Does our life have meaning? And being concerned with one's legacy, recognizing that what we do now could affect humanity going forward can be a great uh, giver of meaning and purpose in a life. So, you know, there's that sense of, do you want to leave the world a better place? And, and what would that look like? What would that mean? I mean, I think it really touches into this idea of legacy. I think various religions have also danced with the value of legacy in different ways. For instance, even in kind of conventional Christianity, the idea that there is a heaven and a hell, the idea that there is an accounting at some point after death, instills a kind of futurity that the things that I do now will have some kind of an impact. It's not quite the same as legacy, but at least it encourages, and probably importantly so in the ancient world, an idea that there is something beyond what is happening in the moment, something beyond just meeting survival needs will have an impact at some point down the line. In Judaism, uh, there's a a wonderful piece in Psalms 9012, where Moses is praying that God would teach his people to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. That there's something about knowing that our days are numbered, knowing that we have a true sense of that, that builds a kind of wisdom into the choices that we may make today and the possible impact that that will have, at least on our children, but maybe even far beyond that, on communities and on nations. So there is something in the religious attitude that also wants to bring a sense of that forward. And many religions, for instance, Buddhism, if people is going in for monastic training, that they will be subject to the meditation on the corpse. And traditionally, when somebody died in the community, it would be laid out in the square, unembalmed, and the young monks would meditate for 30 days on the decaying body of the individual to confront and accept their own mortality, and that there is something powerful about truly accepting one's mortality that makes us more predisposed to be concerned about legacy. And in 
one psychological school, they call it death priming, which is this ability of the way we would prime a pump, this ability to force ourselves as a kind of philosophic discipline to think about our own mortality, to even practice it in our imagination, so that our values are informed by the temporality of our own lives. And of course, in uh, medieval Christianity, there was this practice of memento mori, remember you will die, and it influenced art. There's just some incredible art that's influenced by this, this notion that we have to remember that we will die because it invites this shifted perspective where we're taken out of the immediacy of the time scale of the, the week or the month or the year and, and recalled that this doesn't keep going on forever. So we do have to think of uh, what might happen and w- whether that's, um, you know, if we believe in reincarnation, that we might suffer because we'll come back as a, an ant or something if we haven't attended properly. Or as you were saying in, in um, Christianity, that we might suffer eternal damnation. These invitations to shift out of the immediate small, I want to say sort of uh, ego-mindedness of uh, these survival needs or even just pleasure needs to expand our imagination around our existence and, and the meaning of our existence and what might endure after us. And that presses into the idea of immortality. That immortality is an incredible archetype. When we think about, for instance, the Greco-Roman legends, the fact that the gods were immortal and eternally young, strong, and beautiful was a powerful, powerful archetype. The fact that in Judeo-Christian tradition, the god is both unchanging and eternal strikes us somewhere in our deep, deep psychological foundation. And so the promise that we too could participate in the eternal through considerations and choices that influence other generations forward, which again goes back to this idea of what is the legacy that we might leave through which other people might remember us, but also that we would participate in a kind of philosophic immortality because we have a beneficent influence upon groups of people that will live forward in time. This also is a struggle because we, in in America particularly, live and have been groomed to experience ourselves as consumption machines. And this is something that has happened very powerfully since about the 1930s and 40s, where we've gone from a community of citizens that were bond together by kind of philosophic virtue, for instance, a belief in democracy or fairness or the universality of um, opportunity for all human beings. And within these last decades, that those values and philosophies have been replaced by consumption and capitalism. That what I can buy on Amazon, how much money I can spend, how comfortable I can be, how aesthetic and pleasing my moment-to-moment life can be, is fast become a primary attitude. And that flies in the face of legacy, which can lead us into pretty problematic places. The ability to think about the future, the long future, is a gift in some sense from the gods. It's not something, as far as we know, that animals other than humans are able to do. I mean, I know that there's been a lot of research on animal cognition and animals like crows and primates 
can probably uh, think about the future more than we've given them credit for. But in terms of being able to really project their imagination forward through the generations, that I suspect is a uniquely human attribute. And therefore, again, it is of the gods. I'm thinking about the diagram that shows up in Jungian writings fairly frequently, that there's a vertical line, which is often referred to as kairos, and a horizontal line that is chronos. And it seems to lend itself into our conversation that the horizontal line, I think, has to do with that feeling of immediacy, the nowness, the chronos, that I'm hungry now, or I want to buy that object right now, and I want to click on it now. And these tiny little ticks of horizontal movement that lead finally to the winding down of our lives. But it's focused very much on the physical plane and the needs of the body. I think Kairos, which is a kind of spiritual timelessness that runs vertically, has much more to do with, as you were saying, the time of the gods, the universality of consciousness. And that's much more involved with the idea of intergenerational interest and imagination. That there's something, even in this moment, where the horizontal time of what I want right at the moment and the intergenerational timelessness, the survival of life, intersect. And at that point of intersection, I think the symbol of legacy um, manifests the idea that there is something that is kept alive and vital because it is passed forward and forward and forward and forward. So one important myth, I think, in this conversation has to do with the well-known King Midas. So... Midas was an ancient king, doing well by all standards. The peasants find the satyr Selenius drunk and stumbling around in the town, and the peasants recognize that something strange and extraordinary is happening. They bring Selenius to Midas, who for ten days treats him as an honored guest, feeds him entertains him, and finally, after Selenius has come back to his senses, he returns him, Midas does, to Dionysus, Selenius being the teacher of Dionysus. Dionysus is moved by the generosity and offers to grant Midas a wish, and without foresight or a sense of legacy, Midas asks that everything that he would touch should turn to gold. Famously, on his walk back to his castle, he touches flowers and trees and stones and all manner of things which instantly become this extraordinary, beautiful, priceless golden objects. At first, caught up in his hubris and inflation, he thinks this is the most marvelous, marvelous thing he could imagine. He orders a great feast to be brought before him, and he is shocked that the food that he touches, the drink that he touches, all turn to gold. And he is shortly at the door of starvation. Nathaniel Hawthorne has a famous retelling of the story where his daughter rushes towards him, and he touches her, and she too turns into gold. In some versions of the story, he begs for help, and Dionysus tells him to wash his hands in the river, and as his power flows out of his hands, the sand on the banks of the river turn gold, and he is restored, restored rather, to his natural self. But I think this is a powerful archetypal story about human nature, that when offered the opportunity 
for limitless immediate wealth and status and the symbols of wealth within a given culture, that we are likely to say yes without a sense of what the possible consequences might be. And something that has fallen very much out of collective awareness is the idea of prudence. To be prudent is to sit for a moment in this space as you consider a potential action and ask what the consequences might actually be and to allow the possible futures to temper or shape my choices at this moment. So I fear in many ways we have all embraced a kind of Midas consciousness where the money I can Mm. grab very quickly and in the moment seems to be the most important thing. And right now, as we're in this kind of international economic transformation with cryptocurrency and people spending $10 million on a non-fungible token, that touching any number of things that normally would not be valuable, like a tiny little gif of a cat, touching that and have it it turn into gold and suddenly be worth a million dollars is happening right now in our culture and the repercussions for these kinds of things i don't hear that being discussed yeah what's what's the other side about that i mean it's i'm thinking about the um the real estate bubble mm-hmm. that happened and you know some 20 years or so ago uh, you know, that, that there was this sense that property values were just increasing, increasing, increasing. People thought, well, it's just going to keep going up. It, it's not going to stop because it, it, we want to believe that. But being able to weigh that incredibly seductive promise of sort of unlimited growth against the reality that there, there will be a consequence down the road, uh, it, it's a... It's a real human weakness, I think, that we can so easily be seduced into believing that there won't eventually be some kind of cost or reckoning. And we're seeing that right now, just as you were saying, Lisa, coming on onto this idea of the real estate market. If we perceive the previous generation as being selfish, we are much likely much more likely to not be interested in legacy. And we can hear in the collective how young people who are coming into their first jobs are turning around and saying, I can't afford to buy a house. I can barely afford to pay off my student loans. How is it that the decisions of the generation before me were so selfish that I now do not have a life of the caliber that seems reasonable to me? And that perception that the previous generations have been selfish locks down that sense of futurity and also, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy, pushes people down on that hierarchy of actualization into survival mode. And when people are in survival mode, ideas of legacy disappear. Well, and of course, there's different ways of leaving a legacy, because one could be a philanthropist and leave a lot of money. And of course, the major philanthropists have all been motivated by legacy. When, once you become wealthy and, and powerful, that often becomes a big motivator for people. How will I be remembered? What can I leave behind? How can I, how can I shape? Uh, how can I use my, my wealth and, and my power to shape things for the better? But we can also obviously leave a legacy through our children. Many of us feel a sense of legacy around uh, what will my descendants be like? What kind of people will I be leaving behind? We can leave a legacy in our communities by by spending time uh, giving of ourselves to organizations that will outlast us, whether it's a, a university or a a, a rotary club or or a, a garden club, n- knowing that 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 something of us will will remain that will touch other people's lives just in their their memories of us. 
we may want to leave an artistic or creative legacy, some kind of uh, artistic production perhaps that will outlive us. So there's, there's many ways to engage this question of legacy. We were thinking as we prepared for this uh, episode about Jung's sense of his legacy. And I think that he was uh, motivated strongly by a sense that there was something that he needed to do for the world, that there was some gift that he brought with him that he needed to bequeath. And he thought, I think we have evidence a great deal at the end of his life about how he was going to uh, pass this on and in what hands he was leaving it. He had multiple dreams that pointed at this. One He had a dream that he was seeking the grail. He had this dream when he was in India that he was seeking the grail with uh, several uh, colleagues. And at the end, he was the one who had to strip his clothes off and swim a channel, an icy channel alone, to try to recover the grail. And uh, he says in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, he says, it was as though the dream were asking me, what are you doing in India Rather seek for yourself and your fellows the healing vessel, the servitor mundi, which you urgently need, for your state is perilous. You are all in imminent danger of destroying all that centuries have built up. So the dream seemed to be pointing him toward a concern for his legacy. Toward the end of his life, many people wanted to establish a Jung Institute, and he was opposed to it until finally he turned around and said, yeah, okay, let's do this. You know, Barbara Hanna asked him, you know, why'd you change your mind? And he said, well, you know, I I realize they're going to do it anyway. (laughs) Something's going to happen. He said, they're going to do it between my death and the funeral. So I might as well get involved in it and shape how it, it, it turns out. And um, she also cites uh, this this Mandian text. There's this conversation in this apocryphal um, uh, biblical text, um, a conversation between John the Baptist and Christ, in which the former wants to keep the mysteries secret because people won't understand them and thus will destroy them. And Christ says, everyone should have these secrets because there will be people who will understand them. And, and Jung spoke about this text and how this represented two different attitudes toward passing along knowledge and that there's, there's uh, you know, legitimacy to them both. There's not kind of one right answer, but there is the sense that you come upon um, important knowledge and information and wisdom and that there is a sense that you want to safeguard it somehow. You want to do the right thing by it. You know, the, the last story about Jung and his legacy that I want to bring up has to do with the publication of his book, Man and His Symbols. So uh, John Freeman was an English journalist who um, interviewed Jung for the BBC. And uh, then there was a uh, a man who, who'd seen it, who'd seen the interview, and really, really wanted to do uh, a, a work uh, on, have Jung publish a book that would really be for the general public. And he approached Jung about it, and uh, Jung said, absolutely not, not interested, not interested in doing anything like that. Well, sometime later, Jung had a dream, and here I'm, I'm reading from the, uh, the foreword, or excuse me, the introduction of man and his symbols. This is written by John Freeman. He dreamed that instead of sitting in his study and talking to the great doctors and psychiatrists who used to call on him from all over the world, he was standing in a public place and addressing a multitude of people who were listening to him with rapt attention and understanding what he said. Mm. So the dream pointed Jung toward his legacy, that he could entrust his ideas to the world and that they would continue in a way they would be sort of safeguarded for future generations. And that was such an important 
realization for Jung that he lamented in many places in the collected works that people simply did not understand what he was reaching for. Of course, he was very sensitive to criticism, but more importantly, he was deeply sensitive to his sense of aloneness, that he felt really isolated by the depth of understanding that he had. So for him to have this clarity that sometime, someday, that his words would be understood by a generation was enough to mobilize the magnitude of libido that it would take to begin to form an institute and to yet continue to expand his prolific writings because that was the way that he was and in fact has remained alive. And we <laughs> obviously rest on his legacy. We do indeed. And that has certainly influenced me a great deal in my life, both personally and professionally. I also wanted to let everybody know that Deb is doing just fine. She's not here with us today because she's having a wonderful vacation with her family down in Florida. So we're wishing them all a marvelous tan and much fun frolicking around in Florida. <laughs> She'll be back with us next week. So with that, maybe it's time to look at a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, as you know, my book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, was published in May of 2021 by Sounds True. And since it's been published, I've been feeling most excited and grateful reading the reviews for the book on Amazon and Goodreads. It makes me realize that this journey, which began as a challenging personal inquiry for me, has become a real healing force for many. Motherhood won the Parenting and Family category of the Best Book Awards this year through the American Book Fest, which has been exciting too. But what really feels nourishing to me as an author is hearing what's happening on the ground in people's hearts. And so many people have written to me on email or on social media and let me know how much the book has meant to them. And there's just nothing more gratifying than that, than to hear that the book has meant so much to so many people. So Motherhood is available wherever books are sold in paperback, ebook, and audio formats. And I hope everyone who's meant to dive into the well of its lessons can do so. And I so appreciate hearing from people what they think of it. So keep the emails and the letters and the comments coming. I, they mean a lot to me. There's also a free course that's related to the book and a book excerpt on my author website, which is lisamarciano.com. And I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thank you for asking, Joseph. I'm just uh, so happy for you and it's such a lovely lovely book both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother it's never been written about it hasn't been out there and it's getting such an enthusiastic heartfelt reception it's wonderful yeah i would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed as <laughs> having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. That's mm. right. This week's dreamer comes from a woman who is 30 years old and works as an instructor of computer science. And here's the dream. On the way to our new house... There are big rocks scattered across. When we're just approaching the building site, we come up with a man in his 50s who looks like a fisherman. He holds a snake and shows it to us. 
Then I see lots of snakes around him on the ground. I'm really scared, and I try to move out of the situation as soon as possible. The man's face looks amusing, as if he is challenging us. There is also an old woman beside the man, but it's difficult to determine her age from her face. I find an alternative way to go to the house with my husband. The other way is a bit longer. We climb the big rocks where there is some water falling off from the sides. I don't know whether we finally get out of the situation or not. And here's some context. She says, we're in the process of moving to a new house after three years of searching for one. I'm also in the process of psychotherapy to heal from childhood trauma. My mother has been hallucinating about the snakes coming in from the windows. And she says, the main feelings in the dream were threat, a sense of urgency, and nervousness. And finally, she notes that she's really scared of snakes in real life, and she has some recurring images of snakes in her dreams. Lately, she started incorporating some of the aspects of snakes in her life. She bought herself a snake-shaped ring and wants to be as flexible and ready for transformation as snakes. So I have this sense of delicate treading in this dream. And it leaves me curious about the powerful impact of being raised by a parent who has a history of psychotic experiences and how both the parent, in this case the mom, and the children are swept into a liminal world where the conscious and the unconscious are in some ways overly permeable. We spend so much time as Jungians trying to fight our way down into the unconscious, how to dig through the salt mines till we kind of hit the gold. That's because many of us have been raised in a very materialistic, um, worldly environment. So the unconscious has been kept fairly far away from us, aside from dreaming, of course, which all of us do. But it's strangely different when we're in a home environment where the unconscious is invading the space. So I think the dream, in part, is demonstrating how the psyche navigates around the extraordinary anxiety of finding a new home and moving into it and trying to contain the way the mother complex wants to regress into a fantastical or psychotic state. It's interesting that her animus figure is the one that takes hold of the snakes and tries to manage them. That's probably a kind of compensation for the snakes of anxiety that are moving around in the psychic environment. I mean, there is this a little bit of a bombshell in this submission because she does sort of just um, state somewhat matter-of-factly that her mother had been hallucinating about snakes coming in from the windows. And we, we don't know what to make of that. We don't know if her mother has had a, a lifelong issue with... Um, you know, hallucinations and if there's some psychotic process going on there, or whether perhaps this might be a relatively recent uh, phenomenon related to dementia or medication or, or, or something that we don't understand. We, we don't, we don't know. Um, but I, I'm with you, Joseph, in that it seems to show a kind of permeability of, of the unconscious, that these snakes are, they're sort of everywhere, aren't they? I mean, they're all around. And, and she lets us know that they're not just all around in this dream, that it's pretty common that there are these, these snakes. So there's a sense of perhaps potentially being overrun by this snake con con uh, content, whatever that is. You know, it's interesting because she's apparently with her husband. You know, there's a we. We're just approaching the building. And then there's a man. And I, it's, it's interesting. I'm not sure that I would say right off the bat that I think the man is actually an anonymous figure. He He's a little bit more 
Mm, like a trickster or a magician or a wise old man. He's a fisherman. Mm -hmm. So capable of pulling up contents from the depth. And he's holding a snake. So, you know, that's an unusual thing to be holding a snake. I mean, presumably if it's not a poisonous snake, some people do keep snakes as pets and they might hold the snake. I mean, that's not that unusual. But when we think about people holding snakes, uh, we generally think about it from a symbolic level as uh, being in a certain relationship with a content that is is potentially dangerous or transformative. So I'm thinking of those those uh, snake goddesses who who were holding snakes, or even the the practice in even certain evangelical churches in the South, where you you handle poisonous snakes uh, with the belief that um, God will protect you from a snake bite. So there's something about this man as the snake master. He's holding the snake and he's showing it to us. And and he's challenging the dreamer. He's He looks amused. So that's where there's a, a little bit of a trickster feel to it. You're afraid of the snake. I'm going to challenge you with that snake. And he's accompanied also by an old woman. So there's this uh, a sense almost of a kind of um, a syzygy. There's the male and the female and the female, mm. um, this kind of cosmic wholeness almost between these two. But, but she and her husband are, are sort of the mercy of these almost kind of cosmic forces with these snakes. I, I also felt a certain relief that the man's face looked amused as if he was challenging us. And I was thinking that the man just as you said, could very well be a father figure or a magician or even Moses, you know, who displays the snakes in order to save the community from snake bites in the Old Testament. But he's demonstrating a different attitude, which is this, this feeling of mirth towards the object that normally would be frightening. And mirth is a powerful antidote to paranoia, to be able to look at something and to so radically shift our attitude from one thing to another generally causes a feeling of delight, which is why we like humorists and comedians. They'll start to tell a story, we get into a certain attitude, and then suddenly they shift a perspective and we radically shift with them. And it takes the power away from the thing that we might have found scandalous or distasteful or frightening and we find ourselves laughing so this ability to flip out of fear and into humor or amusement is a powerful almost supernatural ability that human beings have so there seems to be some advice in the dream to consider this different attitude towards the snakes in the consciousness and perhaps not see them quite as dangerous as we might normally. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, and there's no reason to think they're dangerous. He seems to be somewhat the the kind of master of the snake. I mean, he the the snake first makes an appearance in the hand of of this guy. So she's really scared. But as you say, Joseph, he is not and represents this potentially different attitude. So the dreamer's in the midst of a transformation in more than one ways. She's she's moving houses physically, and, and that's referenced in the dream that they're they're on the way to the new house. But she's also moving houses kind of psychologically because she's in therapy to heal childhood traumas. So she is uh shifting her physical and psychological location. And the dream is alerting her that uh, transformation is at hand and it may not be uncomfortable and it might perhaps be challenging. You know, the other thing that figures in this dream besides the snakes are rocks. There are big rocks scattered across the path. She has to climb some big rocks. There are obstacles 
the way is not clear, but um, there, there is a, there is a way. <laughs> and I find it very interesting that the man in his fifties have demonstrated that the snakes can be handled, and it can be handled with a certain kind of amusing attitude. But she chooses instead to try to find an alternative path to sidestep the confrontation with the snakes or sidestep whatever is required for her to feel competent enough to not flee the snakes. And in trying to get around this nexus of suffering in her psyche, she's climbing over rocks, there's water running off the side, and it's not clear whether or not she finds a way to the building site or to the house or out of the situation that there's something about avoiding the confrontation that always creates a complexity in the psyche. And of course it creates complexity in our lived lives. I mean, how many times have we needed to confront something or engage something that evokes ambivalent or negative feelings in us? And we keep putting it off and off and off until finally it reaches a crisis moment. And then the pain of not doing the confrontation kind of matches the pain of avoidance and we feel like we can make a choice. But I think the dream is suggesting she could go back into the dream, meet the snake handler and ask him, what are you here to teach me? And perhaps be able to move in a more direct line wherever her fate is taking her to this new attitude, new life view, new stance, new vision that's represented by the building site. Yeah. Um, snakes obviously are such a huge symbol. I think we should do a whole episode about snakes and we could just go on and on with all kinds of uh, mythological reference and fairy tales and uh, religious imagery. Uh, Jung said at one point in the collected works that snake dreams are always about the instincts, and and in particular, uh, c kind of a, a s s sort of a problematic relationship between consciousness and instinctual life. So I, I think that that's a compelling thing to wonder about. I'm not I'm not prepared to say exactly what I think these snakes refer to, but uh, snakes are uh, they are very instinctual, and they they travel on the ground earthbound. And uh, yet they are uh, obviously symbols of transformation. They, you know, sort of die and are reborn when they, they shed their skin. And uh, the bite of the snake transforms. So um, something is up for this dreamer and these snakes. The early Jungians often thought of snake bite dreams as related to analytic insight as well. That there are certain ideas, certain truths that we discover about ourselves that are so disturbing to who we think we are that at first it feels venomous. But as we metabolize the painful insight, it actually becomes a kind of medicine and it allows us to orient much more successfully to ourselves and to the world. And I noticed that she's also in psychotherapy to heal from some childhood traumas and wounds. We've spent much of our lives at that point trying to encapsulate our childhood wounds, particularly if they're substantial, because they have a certain kind of venomous wisdom in them. And we have to be strong enough to tolerate the bite or at least to handle it in the right way so that we can be in relationship with it without being overwhelmed. So it looks like she's in, a, in an interesting place and that there is some agency, some opportunity for choice. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. 
We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.